Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. Today, I'm going to show you a really cool thing that you can do with your lathe, and that's making your own springs. Now, of course, springs aren't that expensive, and you can buy them in probably every shape and size. So this is maybe the most practical thing to do, but making your own springs is really fun. It's really neat to see that you can do it yourself. And who knows, someday you might have an application where you can't buy the exact thing you need. So I'll show you how to make them right now. Another certain project that I'm working on requires some custom springs that look very much like this. So I thought I'd show you the process of how I went about making them, and hopefully you can learn from this for your own custom springs. The first step is to choose your wire. The two basic choices are music wire, which is a high carbon steel that has springiness to it, or you can use stainless steel spring wire, which is a very stiff form of stainless wire. Obviously the stainless is stainless, but music wire is going to be cheaper and easier to get if you don't need it to be stainless. Next you have to choose the diameter of wire. Obviously the thicker the wire, the more compression force or tension force the spring can handle, and thus the more energy it can store. Now. Look, let's be straight here. This is an enormously complex topic. Entire semesters in mechanical engineering school are devoted to the math around springs. That would be the spring semester. So this is not something you're likely to calculate yourself. If you really want to do it, there is a large section in Machinery's Handbook devoted to spring design. But for the average hobbyist, it's probably easier to just look at a bunch of springs in your life, take apart some ballpoint pens and some door latches and other spring-loaded mechanisms, and measure the diameter of the wire used in those springs. And you can develop kind of an intuitive mental map for how thick the wire you probably need is. I'm using 39 thou wire here, which is definitely the high end of what a hobbyist would ever need. These springs are going to be pretty stiff because they're suspension springs for a small vehicle that is going to take a fair amount of weight. Now we need to make some tools to enable us to make the springs on the lathe. Start with some steel round bar. I'm using 1144 here. Something fairly strong is a good idea. There's going to be quite a bit of force on this mandrel that we're about to make. Tool steel would not be a terrible idea, but it doesn't have to be hardened or anything like that. I'm going to put a center drill in the end of this thing because we're going to need lots and lots of tail support. In addition to turning a long length, the final mandrel is going to need a lot of tail support for the forces that are going to be on it while we make the springs. So tail support, not optional. This piece of scrap that I'm using happens to have some old diameters and threads and stuff on it that I'm turning off. You want to turn this mandrel down to the arbor size for the spring diameter that you want to make, which is not one to one. As you've no doubt surmised, we're going to be wrapping the spring wire around this mandrel to form the spring. However, funny thing about spring wire, it's springy. So the mandrel that you wrap it around has to be smaller than the final spring you want because it's going to expand once you take the tension off of it after you're done making the spring. So then the question is, how much smaller should the mandrel be? Again, that's actually pretty complicated to calculate, but luckily Machinery's Handbook has our back here. There's actually a big chart in that book that explains exactly how big your mandrel should be for a given wire diameter and desired final spring diameter. So that's nice. Give yourself about double the length of your final springs on that wire wrapping area. You're going to need more room than you think, as you'll see. I'm also turning down the larger far end of the mandrel, I'm going to keep that area open for turning other diameters for future spring making, and also it's helpful to have extra room down there as well for the tools that we're going to be using. Next you want to put a nice taper between these two diameters. This looks nice, but is actually important to the function of the wrapping of the spring as you'll see. That's it for the lathe work on this mandrel, so I can part this off and we're going to be ready for the next step. And fake Yahtzee. One more detail required for this mandrel is a cross hole, and that's going to hold the wire to start the wrapping process. This is easiest to do on the mill. I'm going to stick it in a collet block for this purpose. You could also do this with a cross drilling fixture or holding it in a V block in the vise. Plenty of ways to drill a cross hole. To get centered up, this is a good excuse to use a fun old school tool that I've had in my drawer for a while but haven't used, and that's this center finder. This thing goes in your spindle and then the movable V-shaped piece rides on the round stock that you're trying to center. And the way this works is you apply light pressure with the quill, and then you move the Y-axis back and forth on the mill until the tick mark on the movable jaw lines up with the tick mark on the stem. You can kind of intuit how this is working just by seeing what it does. This is obviously not as accurate as edge finding or other methods of finding center of a round part, but it's pretty good and it's very, very quick. This would be an easy tool to make also if you wanted to 
do a beginner project of some sort. Then drill that through a little bit larger than the wire that you're using. You want it to be easy to slide the wire into the hole, but not easy for it to pop out again on its own. It's important that the cross hole be through the larger diameter of the mandrel, not the spring wrap diameter. You'll see why in a moment. That's tool number one for spring making. Tool number two requires a rectangular piece, so for that I'll go back to the scrap bin, and something like either of these would work fine. It needs to be something that will fit in the tool holder on your tool post. To that end, I'm going to blue it up, and I'm going to install it in my tool post to mark out some dimensions. You want the piece to be able to stick out past the front edge of your tool post, as you see here. And I'm going to scribe a line here because we need to make this into an L shape. So I want to leave just enough material on the inside for the tool holder to hold it, and then I'll square it off at the end so that I can have an L shape piece that sticks out past the front of the tool holder, like so. And I'll cut that chunk out. That's a pretty big chunk to remove, so rather than turning it into chips and wasting it, I will rough cut it on the bandsaw. And then the remaining chunk can go back in the bin, and I'll use it for something else in the future. I'll save a lot of cutter wire as well. And I'll put this in the mill and clean up that saw cut. There's no dimensions or anything on this part, I'm absolutely just eyeballing everything. Something that looked about right on the tool post, as you saw, and I'm cleaning up the edges so that they look nice, and really nothing else matters. Once I've cleaned up that surface, I leave the end mill locked at that same height, and I do a couple of side milling passes on the short extension to clean up that surface and make a nice, sharp inside 90 corner. Finally, I side milled the end of the piece, which were also rough saw cuts from whatever previous life this piece of scrap had. This is probably a waste of time, but you know, if you're going to make your own tools, you might as well make them look nice, especially if you're going to keep them and use them over time, as I do plan to do with all of these tools. The next setup is kind of a funny looking one. I need to stand the piece on end at a 10 degree angle. I've got an angle block for that, and I'm gripping the piece by the end. Now obviously this is not a rigid setup, but we only need to drill a very tiny hole, so this will be fine for that. I start by putting the drill that I'm going to use in the chuck, and I make sure that the position I want for the hole is going to come through in a good place on both sides. And then I center it up roughly on the L-shaped extension with a scale. And I'm going to center drill this because we have a 10 degree angle and I don't want the drill to wander off. Because this is just a 10 degree angle, we can get away with just a center drill dimple. If the angle was much more than this, you'd really need to make a flat spot with an end mill first. And for that, you'd need a much more rigid setup than I have here. But because I'm just doing a slight angle and I'm using a tiny, tiny drill, I can get away with a center drill dimple and this crazy, not at all rigid setup. This hole is the same diameter as the one in the mandrel. This is a very high aspect ratio hole. It's quite deep relative to the diameter of the drill, so lots and lots of peck drilling is the secret. Otherwise, you're gonna jam up the drill and break it. I chose a location that puts that hole near the top on the front and kind of roughly in the middle on the back. And here's how the wire feeds through. So sitting in the lathe like this, so you can see that that hole feeds the wire through at an upward angle of 10 degrees. That's important for how it's going to relate to the mandrel. The purpose of this block is to allow us to control and steer the wire with the tool post as we're doing the winding. It's crucial that the movement of the wire be carefully controlled by the tool post and not by hand. You can't do this by hand, it's never going to work. So now I can put the mandrel in there. Three jaw chuck is fine. The concentricity is not super important here. And now I'll feed the wire in, and we want to set up the relationship of that new guide block tool that we just made with the mandrel. I'm going to adjust the height of the tool post until the wire is feeding just over the top of the wire wrap section of the mandrel. You can see how that 10 degree angle feeds it up nicely over the top of the small diameter. That's what you want. Okay, it's time for wire. You really want to cut a section of wire to work with. Resist the urge to use the entire coil in this fixture, it'll never work. Those coils are very difficult to manage, and if it springs on you, you're going to be having a very, very bad day. To cut this stuff, you need to use grinding tools. Don't try to use nippers or any other bladed tool like a saw. Spring wire is very, very hard, and you'll damage those tools. For the same reason, if you need to deburr it, use a stone and not a file. So cut off a piece of it a lot longer than you think you're going to need. The springs that I'm making here, don't look like much, but they actually have almost 11 inches of wire in them. So cut off a bigger piece than you think you need. Okay, we're ready for the magic. Taking a look at a spring, you notice how the wire forms 
a helix? Guess what machine in your shop is really good at making helixes? The lathe. That's right, we're going to set our lathe to cut threads that are the same pitch as the coils in this spring. So in this case, I've got six coils spaced 100 thou apart. So we're going to need to set the lathe to 10 threads per inch, or whatever a bunch of metric numbers are that match that. I'm doing this with change gears, but of course, if you have a gear cutting transmission on your lathe, then you can set some knobs and levers for whatever thread pitch you need. The other thing to note, of course, is that being a helix, the wire has to feed at an angle. So I'm going to set my tool post angle over a little bit. Again, just eyeballing this is fine. If it's sort of in the ballpark, then it'll work. Then I'll feed the wire through, and we can feed it into the mandrel. You want to feed it in about halfway through the mandrel, not too far, or it would be very difficult to remove later, and not too little, or it'll pop out while you're winding the spring, which is super annoying. Next, I wrap the wire around the mandrel, just turning the chuck by hand, and let that taper feed the wire down onto the wrapping mandrel. You can see now why that taper is important. Now it's time for some tension. I find it easiest to do this with smooth jaw pliers. Do not try to do this with your hand. You won't be able to hold it tight enough, and if you're going to be doing this under power, that's a really good way to lose a finger. With tension on, I'm going to wind the chuck by hand and put a couple of wraps of closed coil at the end. You want a couple of wraps of closed coil at each end of a compression spring, or if you're doing a tension spring, then all the coils are closed. As I'm doing these, I'm also moving the carriage forward a little bit by hand just to keep the closed coils from piling up on each other. You want a couple of extra wraps at the leading edge of the spring because that end gets distorted when you pull it off the mandrel. Okay, magic time. Now it's time to engage the half nut. Then we keep applying wraps. The next couple wraps are still going to be closed because the half nut has to take up the backlash in the carriage, but then you're going to see the coils start to open up. Once this happens, Mark the chuck, maybe with some tape or a sharpie, and start counting your turns. Then keep turning and count the number of turns of the chuck for the number of open coils that you want in the middle of your spring. Now you could do this part under power if you really want to. Honestly, unless you're making very long springs, I wouldn't. You're going to create a lot of drama and danger for really no value. But if you do want to do it, do it at very low RPM and make sure the lathe is running in reverse. Once I have the right number of open coils, then I disconnect the half nut and I do a couple more wraps and that creates another one and a half to two closed coils at the far end. This end won't get distorted, but we do need some room to work with as you'll see. Now it's time to extract the wire from the tool post. So I wind the carriage back, but I hold the wire with the pliers and let it go slowly. This is the moment where it's going to spring. You do not want that free end to hit you in the hand because holy dina does that hurt. For the leading end, I have to pry it out of the mandrel, and this is why you don't want to stick the wire too far in. This is also why the cross hole is in the larger diameter, because it's way, way easier to get the wire out. If that cross hole had been in the small diameter, it's very difficult to extract it without destroying the spring. This might look like a hot mess, but if you use your imagination, there's actually a perfect little spring in the middle of this hot mess. Let's go clean that up now. For the next step, it helps to take a look at a commercial spring. The ends of a compression spring need to be square, and this can be done in two ways. Most cheap commercial springs like this one are what's called open end. They fake a square end by having the final wrap flatten out and do one half turn, ending touching the coil below it. This works okay at small wire diameters for faking a square seat, but it's kind of chintzy. Larger springs or higher quality springs will actually taper the final coil into the coil below to create a truly square and flat seat all the way around. You'll see this a lot on high quality car springs, for example. Part of the reason you shouldn't cut down your car springs if you want to lower your car, not to mention you're borking up the spring rate when you do that. Don't be a buster, just buy shorter springs. To make proper square ground seats, we're going to need a third and final tool. It has to attach to your bench grinder tool rest. I happen to have a miter slot on my shop made tool rests, so I'm measuring that. I'm going to use that to secure the fixture and keep it square. I went back to the scrap bin and I found this piece here, which should work just fine. Any old piece of scrap will work. I'm going to once again square this up and make it reasonably presentable for the next step. 
Next I machine a key that's going to register in the miter slot that I measured. This is going to help secure the piece on the grinder table and also keep it square to the grinding wheel. Obviously this step would be different. It's going to just depend on what your tool rest looks like. You can just do this with a straight rectangular bar and simply clamp it to the tool rest as well. You don't have to get all fancy, but I have the miter slot and this only took a minute, so what the heck. By sneaking up on that dimension and getting a really nice close fit on my miter slot, that holds it really securely and keeps the piece square. So I think that's going to be a nice thing. Finally, I'm going to clamp it the other way and drill a cross hole through this, which is going to hold the spring. Because of the key shape, I need to put a parallel in there to hold it securely. You might ask yourself, why didn't I drill the hole first so that I wouldn't need to do that little trick? And the answer is because shut up, that's why. This hole should be slightly larger than your target spring diameter, plus a little more because your springs are not likely to be perfect diameters. The location of this hole is not super critical, but I'm leaving extra room around it for other holes later for different spring diameters. Here's how that piece clamps to the table. You can see that we're going to be doing the grinding on the side of the wheel, and that's going to ensure nice square spring seats. Back to the hot mess then, I can clean up the ends a bit before grinding. As you can clearly see through my transparent finger, I'm just using the corner of the grinding wheel to remove the excess wire, and it doesn't hurt to do a little bit of deburring and make sure that the wire at the end isn't sticking out past the diameter of the spring. You want to make sure that's not distorting, because then it won't fit into the fixture for the next step. With both ends cleaned up, now I can stick them in the end of the fixture and square up the ends. You can also remove extra coils this way, or you can also use the corner of the wheel to chop off extra coils a half wind at a time if you've got a lot of extra closed coils at the end to remove. The ideal compression spring has a half to one full closed coil at the end, not much more than that. And just do this until the spring is down to the final length that you want. I'm grinding one end and then the other depending on which end has excessive closed coils on it at the moment. If you're making a tension spring, of course, you don't have to do this step. Just leave yourself one extra closed coil at each end Bend those closed coils outwards 90 degrees to create attachment points, and you're done. Make sure to dunk in water frequently while you're doing this grinding, because if you overheat the wire, you can anneal it by accident. And if you do that, well, it's no longer a spring. Now it's just a piece of wire arranged in a very highfalutin way. Here's roughly the result that you're aiming for. I've got the number of open coils that I wanted, which is six, and then a half to one full turn of closed coil at each end, and everything is ground flat, so the closed coil tapers into the open coil below. With some care and practice, this process is also nice and repeatable. So these eight springs are all within five thousandths of the same length, and they all have the correct number of open coils and closed coils on them. All these tools should be reusable as well. I'm not going to tell you you have to 3D print a storage case for them, but it doesn't hurt. You may have to turn additional mandrels for other springs, or you may have room on that one to turn other diameters. But if nothing else, certainly the wire feeder and the seat grinder can be reused for all sorts of other springs that you might need to make. Now, I made all that look easy because I kept all the best takes so you can see what the process is supposed to look like. But rest assured, there is a learning curve here. You will mangle lots of them before you get it right. You'll make them too short. You'll make lots of other mistakes. But don't be discouraged. After a few false starts, you will get the hang of this and the feel for how the carriage is supposed to look and move while it's winding and so on. So stick with it. It's really not that difficult, but it does take a little bit of practice. Well, that's all the time I have for you this week. Thank you so much for watching, and thanks to my patrons for making all of this content possible. I hope you enjoyed this, and I'll see you next time.